What's up, Boilermakers? Ian McDougall with Purdue Women's Basketball. Today we're catching up with the newest member of the coaching staff, Coach Michael Scruggs. Coach, thanks for taking some time to talk to me today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So, obviously, first thing everybody's wanting to know, uh, we've all kind of been on our own for the last month or so. How have you been holding up? I've been holding up uh, as best as I can. And, you know, it's kind of tough when you're going through the whole season and you're just bang, bang, bang every day, all day practice recruiting, scouting, playing games, and then you, you go four or five days later and you confine to your house. So it's a very big adjustment for me, but I'm managing okay right now. What, uh, what's the daily routine been like? Because I know Coach has been like, she said, you know, I woke, she wakes up at like 6 a.m., she works out, and then she does some calls, and then she'll make lunch and then work out again. And like, she's been saying it's the best shape she's ever been in. <laughs> I actually, I, I'm similar to her. I wake up, I, I get my workout in first thing in the morning. From there, I, I cook my own breakfast. And then from there, I start making my recruiting phone calls, whether it be coaches. And then later in the day, I, you know, I'll start hitting up players. But then during that time, we're, I mean, we're always maintaining conversation within our staff, too, and our players. Um, and then later in the night, you know, I, I try to make sure that what, at least every other day I'm, I'm cooking dinner. So just trying to add to my cooking repertoire right now. What's the most creative thing you've made so far? Uh, I grilled some turkey burgers on my grill uh, about a week and a half ago, and they were actually very surprisingly good. I'm actually craving one uh, sometime this weekend. That's, that's, uh, we moved into our house right before the season, but like uh, my wife and I have been doing like cast iron skillet steaks, like okay. right, on, right on the uh, stove, so. Uh, if you want to try something new, it's, it's well worth it. Okay. Um, yeah. Have you been, have you been binging any shows or, or listening to any podcasts lately? I have been binging um, Ozark. My girlfriend had me start to binge watch uh, Breaking Bad. I'm about <laughs> finished with that. And now I'm about to jump into all American. Mm. And then uh, quite naturally, I mean, a basketball fan, you got to watch the last dance with Jordan. I mean, that's just something I'm glued to every week. What four episodes in at this point? What's been your favorite favorite thing you've seen so far? Uh, just the actual um, turmoil within the organization. I thought it was very interesting how Jerry Krause was just so anti Phil Jackson, uh, which is crazy to me because right. Phil Jackson yeah. was glued to Michael Jordan. So how could you be that anti Phil? I just didn't understand that. But that was actually really surprising to me. Um, but I also felt that, you know, the whole uh, treatment of Scotty, I didn't realize he was that, that low paid on the, on the totem pole. I thought that was super interesting as well. Uh, but despite all of that, just, just hearing the back and forth from, from Jordan is, is really interesting because he's, he's always been my favorite player. Well, I, watching the, where he talked about the, how the Pistons walked off and they, they were holding that. They were like, you know, here's what Isaiah said. And just watching him, you're like, I, I don't want to hear it. I already know it's, it's not true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nothing, you, nothing you can say will convince me otherwise. I was like, wow. <laughs> but, and uh, they briefly mentioned it. Uh, I remember when I was uh, in college, um, Purdue fans won't like this too much, but I went to uh, a speech that Bob Knight gave. And he, he just talked about the, the Olympics that he coached with MJ. And he just mm -hmm. said there was one time he walked in before, I want to say it was before either – uh, like quarterfinals or semifinals or something he you know he was ready to draw everything up on the board and somebody had erased everything and and MJ was just like coach we got it don't worry and he yeah. went at that point he's like all right well we we knew this was uh coach was telling me about how she's you know through Nike uh, and a couple of the relationships in the coaching world she knows Roy Williams pretty well and, and she's like how honest he was about like just seeing him like you know didn't really know about him before he came to the camp and then he came to the camp and you know when the camp ended like they said in the show he was the number recruit yeah number one recruit yeah yeah <laughs> they, they loved him um how much when you were growing up did you uh were the bulls your team or who'd you who'd you watch growing up they were 100 percent my team yeah i was uh i think i was 10 when jordan won that last championship in 96 so I was able to, to really like hone in and watch that second three-peat. Um, and then from there, I mean, quite naturally, I just gravitate to basketball because I just 
I was a big time Bulls fan, had the jersey, had the shoes, had the shooting shirt, had all that stuff, man. So big time Bulls fan um, and big time Jordan fan as well. Wow, that's it. It, it doesn't hurt to it, it's helpful that they they were smart enough to kind of do the documentary series or at least have, you know, camera guys with them that whole mm-hmm. last year. Um, it's, and I heard, I read something that Kobe basically did that for his final season. So Kobe did do that in 20, 20 years. <laughs> I heard that as well. I heard that as well. That's definitely going to be uh, another docu docu series with Kobe. I'm also looking forward to that because Jordan and Kobe were always my two favorites. Um, I was fortunate enough to see pretty much all of Kobe's career because that was kind of the end of Jordan's. Um, and I kind of gravitated more to Kobe as I as I grew older, but Jordan is still my my favorite player, hands down. Well, now that we've kind of had some time to sit down and reflect a little bit, first season at Purdue, you know, just we don't have to dive into every single game, every little practice or everything, but just your first year at Purdue, uh, what were your thoughts on it? Oh, first year. Um, first of all, again, just super thankful for the opportunity that Sharon gave me to be a part of the staff. Um, ever since I've been here, they've all always welcomed me with open arms. Um, it's a joy to go to, to, to the office every day to, to work with them. Um, and then on top of that, you know, being this profession, you know, you're practicing with your team every day. You're getting better with, with your senior kids every day, somehow, some way. And so it makes your job even more enjoyable when you have good kids, not only good players, but good kids on and off the floor. They're fun to be around. They work hard. And uh, it just makes for a great environment. Um, Super, super excited to be here. Um, I, I felt like, you know, unfortunately our season was cut short because of the COVID, but I felt like we were really trending in the right direction at the right time. And we put in a lot of work, our coaching staff, you know, put in a lot of preparation. And uh, over, overall, I thought that we had a, a really good season. Well, it, it's, for all the players I've talked to so far, that's one of the things they said was, you know, it was a good start to the season. Uh, obviously it took some, it took a few weeks to readjust when Tam went down, but mm-hmm. almost everyone said, you know, going into big 10 tournament play and they were really looking for the NCAA tournament. Cause that was probably the best basketball we were playing at that point. I agree. I agree. I felt that, you know, it took us some time to, to really kind of mesh and find our identity post Tam because she was so important to our team, but I felt like our, our players really bought in and collectively they kind of did it by committee. And we were really, we were really gelling towards the, the end of uh, the regular season as well as, you know, the Big Ten tournament. So um, I was really looking forward to the NCAA tournament. It's a shame that it, it kind of ended that way. But I, I totally agree. We, we were totally uh, trending in the right direction. Well, it, and I want to take you back probably to the first week you started. You and I both started roughly the same week, maybe a day or two apart. Um, Australia. Obviously, you and I lucked out to our first week on the job was – getting to go halfway around the world. What do you, what do you like about that trip? Not only just personally, like getting to go to land down under, but also just what did it do for the team? Well, first of all, I took the job. And then I think 10 days later, I'm going to Australia. So I tell everybody when I took the job, it was like a signing bonus. The fact that I was going on a foreign tour to Australia. Um, I was so fortunate to, to be able to go in such a quick, quick, um, quick span. But I felt like the, the reason why it was so important for me to go on that trip was because I was able to to build relationships with the kids um, going into the season. I mean, that's really, really important. Um, and the kids, like I said before, they opened me, I mean, they uh, accepted me with open arms, just like our staff. And it was really, really good to be around them, practicing day-to-day basis. I mean, I would make a point to, when we would go out to eat, I would make a point to sit and eat with little clusters of kids here and there just so they could you know show face and and talk and get to know me because at the same time I was trying to get to know them as well so I felt from a a standpoint of me being new and being submerged where it's just you and the staff and the players all day every day for 10 days I felt that that really caught me up to speed uh, with everybody and it was something that uh, I think that really really benefited me it's in such a quick time well and aside from our travel snafu that we had at the start. And for those of yeah, you who can't forget about that. <laughs> for, for those of you at home who don't know, uh, oh, man. we were going from LA to Melbourne. Uh, our flight got canceled uh, just due to some mechanical difficulties. 
Fortunately, the folks at LAX got our team on an Air New Zealand flight from, uh, from LA to Auckland, and then they went from Auckland to, to Melbourne. But for some reason, there were like six or seven of us who, who couldn't get on that first flight. It was like you, me, Aaron Reimer, our GA, Nancy Cross, our SWA, and then a couple of our, our uh, you know, friends of the program couldn't make it. And we got on a plane like three hours later, and th- but we couldn't get on the same flight as the team from New Zealand to Melbourne. So like we were like four or five hours behind. They couldn't check or add our bags to that, that flight. It. That's what it was. That's what it but, was. But it was just – it was terrifying for the point of like, okay, so the team's going, but are, are we just getting back on a plane to go back to Indianapolis or? Yeah. <laughs> I think it was because they added us to the manifest late. Like we were the last, you know, five or six to be added to the, the team manifest. So we kind of, we kind of caught the unlucky draw right there when it came to that. But I think the only thing we really missed was the first initial practice. Yeah. Cause I think we had one like little shoot around practice before that game. That's all that we really missed, but we were able to, we were able to catch up though. Well, it, but fortunately that's that's the practice right after everybody got off like a 16 hour plane ride so yes. like yes well, i'm okay not being at that one yes yeah yes. um after that though what was your favorite part uh from that trip oh hands down going to the the school and um doing the community service to the underprivileged school i had a blast with that just being able to um put smiles on other people's faces um, our kids really bought into that. We didn't have to pry to to try to like, hey, you got to do this, you got to do that. They were totally up to volunteer to help, and um, it, a lot of that has to do with with coach and just her passion for for giving back to other people and you know being active in the community. And I mean, it starts with her, but it definitely trickles down all the way down to our players, and you can tell that it's real. And uh, me being kind of new to the program, and you know, then jumping on a plane going to Australia and being um, doing community service with the team. It was something that I really, you know, easily picked out very quickly and uh, really solidified it and made me know that I was definitely in the right place. Well, and one of the things I love about our program um, and I bounced around, I've been at a couple different schools in my career, but um, the players really buy into doing community service, whether it's, you know, Absolutely. whether it's hope on the horizon or any of the galas we've been to or, volunteering at the hunger hike like the kids really embrace the opportunity to get out in the community and try to make a difference they do they do um moving a little bit to the basketball side of things um obviously you work primarily with with the guards um Mm -hmm. just take me through kind of uh the the approach you've had with with the the core of guards this year that uh, that we have Really, um, the approach that I have, I, I just always try to make myself a service to these to these players. And so anytime they want to get in the gym, I say, you know, just give me 30 minutes to an hour heads up beforehand. I'll make myself accessible to you, for you in the gym, whether it's putting up shots, whether it's working on ball handling. Sometimes I'll be like, hey, coach, I need to watch film. I need to see, you know, my minutes from last game. They'll come into my office. We'll watch film as well. But I just really try to take the approach of, you know, always being a service to them, trying to help them any and every way that I can. Um, and I think by doing that, they, they're able to, you know, really see how real you are and have that relationship. And uh, with that relationship, you're, you know, you're able to coach them and coach them hard. And they're able to take it and know that when you do coach them hard, that it's coming from a good place and that you want to uh, you better them, not as a basketball player, but as a person. And so I just try to take that approach with them. Um, I, we had a really good group this year of guards. I mean, quite naturally, Dominique Oden was the highlight, not, not to mention, you know, Carissa McLaughlin as well. So. We had good players, good kids, and uh, it, it made it easy for, easy for me, honestly. Who, uh, one of the things I always loved was that, you know, you were kind of always that calm, reassuring voice whenever, you know, a player came out or it was during a timeout. Like, you know, some, you know, coach has a quick word, coach Kutri has a quick word, and then, you know, they would always come down and talk to you, and you just sit there, point them out, and, and, and help, you know, help them see, you know, what you wanted them to see. Who, who over the course of the year do you think made the biggest jump? Ooh, good question. Uh, I felt that um, quite naturally Carissa and Nick had a, a really good year. I felt like Roxanne really made a jump. Um, I thought that she started, she started to open up more and she started to play more free. Um, and you could tell a lot of that had to do with the fact that, you know, she was in the gym a lot. So she was con- constantly building that, that, um, that confidence tank 
uh, you know, when you do stuff in the gym and you do it when nobody's looking, when people start looking and you're doing it in front of people, it makes it easier because you've done it before. And I think that's why she was able to, to have success. She's also an extremely coachable kid. Uh, she, she works extremely hard. She plays extremely hard. And she's very much a, a we first and a, a team player. And uh, it was good to see her, her growth and, and maturation throughout the season. Well, and it's not that it's rare nowadays, but it, it's, it's not a, a standard part of a player to where defense is, you know, for a guard is kind of her best attribute. She, she might be one of the best on-ball defenders and team defenders I've seen in a while. Yeah, she, she plays hard. Um, she takes it, the thing about her when she's on defense, she takes it as a challenge. She, you could tell the kid loves to compete. She takes it as a challenge when somebody comes at her. And that's why you see her just hounding people and being all over them because um, when people on offense, they want to get the best out of you, but she wants to get the best out of you on, on top of that. So that's, what, that's why she, she sells out on the defensive end. I, she had, and I remember watching her. She had one or two possessions against uh, uh, the Wosu girl from Maryland. And I was, you know, I, I don't think a Wosu scored or she just had to dish it off because she, she tried penetrating and Rox was there the whole time. That's another thing, though, because Awusa was so physical. Uh, Roxanne kind of combats that because of her length and just how active she is and how long she is, not to mention her athleticism. So that it makes her for a, a tough matchup when people are trying to attack her because she's such a you know a tough defender. And quite naturally, that game she did a great job on Awusu, and she's just a tough defender. Well, it, talking a little bit about your approach, kind of, we. For those folks back home who probably don't know everything, you have a pretty darn good coaching pedigree. Um, you know, when you were uh, an undergrad, you were a, a practice player and worked with Pat Summit at Tennessee. Mm -hmm. You worked with Nikki Fargus when you were at LSU. You worked with Wes Moore when you were at UT Chattanooga, who's now the head coach at NC State. And obviously now you get to work with Coach Bursa. Um, first question, obviously, what was it like to work uh, and learn from uh, from Pat Summit. It was an unbelievable experience. Um, the thing is, at the time, you know, you kind of took it for granted because I saw her every day for four years. <clears throat> and um, looking back at it, just the wealth of knowledge that she had, the way that she was able to coach her players, again, like she could coach them hard, um, and she would also coach her best player hard. And it's sometimes it's hard for people to do that, to coach your, your best player hard. But um, the thing that I love most about it is just she just had a, a very um, caring spirit about it. Like there would be times she'd come into practice and um, I would be in there shooting before practice start and she'd come in there and she'd just shoot the bull with me. And she'd be like, how's your family doing? How are your classes doing? And um, it, it was just – it was super – looking back at it, it was just super interesting – how much of a caring person she was because I was just a little practice player, um, but she cared about my schooling and, and how I was doing to making sure that I was bettering myself. So that's one of the things I remember most about her, just, just how caring she was and not to mention, you know, the phenomenal coach that she was on top of that, but it was a wonderful experience for me. Um, a lot of people also forget like during that time, she was a head coach. Holly Warlick was her longtime assistant who then took over as a head coach. Uh, Nikki Fargus was her, uh, one of her assistants, who's now the head coach at LSU. And then Dean Lockwood was the other assistant, who's now the associate head at Michigan State. So I was able to learn and build relationships with them at such a, a young age. And uh, it definitely benefited me big time. But, and it wasn't like – and you were there during some of the good years. I mean, you were there during Candace Parker's time, uh, Alexis Hornbuckle's time. What was – you know, uh, if I remember right, it's two national championships you, you got to be a part of. What was that experience like? It was it, – it's really cool because you get to know them on a personal level. I was there from 05 to 08. But I was really able to get to know the players on a personal level because we were all just real tight. We'd all hang out, spend time with each other, go out to eat. And um, to see them – just really just be normal people, but then to watch them on TV and see them get so much pub, go to the final four, and then you come back and we're eating lunch at Jimmy John's and they're like, oh, well, Scruggs, I'm about to take this, this uh, math test and I'm gonna struggle on it. And I'm like, well, I'm gonna struggle on it too. But then two days later, they're winning a national championship. So it's just really cool because 
I, I knew them so well. We we have still maintained you know good relationships to, with them to this day. But uh, it was just a very invaluable experience. Well, so you go from Tennessee and Pat Summit, and then obviously getting to work with Ness, Westmore and then Nikki Fargus and then a, a host of other coaches. How is how is the last you know decade you know your first decade in in the coaching realm? Um, how how you know. Where do you think you've grown the most over over that time learning from so many greats? Oh, good question. Um, I'll just try to pry out um, on some of them here and there. I mean, I think the biggest thing from Wes, I just learned uh, his preparation and the way he prepares for each game, um, the way that he uh, would always be prepared for practices, um, X's and O's. I mean, he would, he always had that little play sheet, you know, bring it out of his pocket and he always be looking at plays during the game. Um, just his X's and O's approach along with his preparation really stood out to me um, because I was coming from being a practice player to then being a, a GA at UTC, kind of helping a little bit here and there with the video stuff. And uh, just seeing the way that he operated was really interesting to me. So I learned, I learned that from him. Um, Nikki Caldwell, I want to say it was two years later, I was able to be on her staff at LSU. And um, she is just a masterful motivator. There would be sometimes she would give pregame speeches and then I'd be ready to freaking go. I mean, she just, <laughs> she just had a way about herself to just, that could just fire everybody up in the room. And um, that's something that really, really stuck out to me. Quite naturally, you know, she's a phenomenal coach as well, did a great job recruiting. Um, and she's so personable. I think that she got that from Pat, just the, the way that she's so personable and caring. I see some similarities from, from Nikki and Pat in that aspect. Um, and now being where I'm at now at Purdue, quite naturally, I'm able to learn from, from Coach. I mean, Coach, just like Wes, big time in preparation, always prepared every practice, every drill, everything is detailed. I love that because she's constantly challenging us as a staff to better ourselves and improve our growth and our knowledge. And um, the thing about coach too that sticks out to me is just the way that she's a player's coach. I mean, she just loves her players, man. She does. I mean, there's no denying that. I mean, these kids, they'll come, they'll come to the office, and a lot of times you'd be like, oh, okay, you think that they're coming to see you, but then they're going to hang out with coach. <laughs> then they'll leave, and then they'll just walk out. I'm like, oh, so you can't say hi to me? Like, what's up with that? Like, <laughs> but no, these, these kids, I mean, she's definitely a player's coach. She does any and everything she can to help them on and off the court. Um, and uh, she's just she's just a phenomenal coach. X's and O's, preparation, scouting, recruiting. Um, I'm I'm super super blessed to be here to to be able to learn from her. So I, I've just been very lucky at such a long young age to learn from such good coaches and uh, to be able to kind of morph myself and my approach as I continue to grow as a coach and kind of pick things from them here and there um, to have my own kind of identity because. Um, I think that's really important. Um, but the biggest thing for me is uh, I always try to just be a sponge and learn as much as I can. Um, I, learned that, I learned that from Pat. She, she made this comment one time, you know, learning stops when you feel like you have all the answers. So I kind of always, always feel like there's always something you can pick up on because uh, you always want to keep moving forward. So that's the biggest thing for me. I just try to be a sponge and just learn as much as I can. Well, and it probably helps, you know, a, that you've had so many great mentors, in, you know, over the start of your career. How has that helped you when you kind of go into that, uh, you know, as the recruiting coordinator at Purdue? How, how have you used those experiences when you're, when you're talking to, you know, 16, 17, 18-year-old uh, young ladies who are trying to make one of the biggest decisions in their life? I think you just got to be yourself. Um, you got to be yourself. You got to be relatable. Uh, and then you got to be informative. You got to know, you got to know what you're talking about. You got to know what you're selling. I mean, quite naturally, we have a lot to sell here. We're, you know, a top, top 10 academic institution, um, lead the league in attendance year in and year out. I mean, you average 6,500 fans a game. And then on top of that, we won one more big 10 championships than anybody in the league. So we got a lot to sell here. Quite naturally, on top of that, you have coach. He's been here 14 years. I've been to 10 NCAA tournaments four Big Ten titles. Um, so it makes, it makes the selling points easy for me, honestly. So being able to, to know what you're selling, but then just being personable enough to, 
just get to know kids, get to know their families. I always try to make a point to get to know mom and dad because mom and dad are important in this recruiting process as well. And when a kid comes and commits and decides to come play for you, the parents have to sign off on that and they want to know where I'm sending my kid to. So I always feel that it's huge um, within that process to get to know mom and dad and uh, just build relationships. That's the biggest thing. Well, it, one of the things that I've, and I've kind of reiterated this in every conversation so far is that the team is unique in the fact that most teams have at least two clicks, you know, the old kids and the young kids or, mm -hmm. you know, wherever our team really doesn't have any, like our, our team just, you know, you'll see uh, a group of, of players. It's always different whether who's hanging out. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things I, I thought was really cool is the fact that, you know, like Cassidy has a really good relationship with, with Madison coming in and a couple other players have really tight relationships with Rashea. You know, it, it seems that it's really, it might be even uh, easier for you sometimes with the fact that, you know, your players are bought in and, and really want to help make this program take the next step as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's important. I mean, just as much as coaches do recruiting, the players have to do recruiting as well, get to know their teammates or future teammates. That's why official visits are big. You know, we try to, you know, make sure that our team has as much information about these recruits as much as possible. Um, and we want them to be themselves, be transparent, be honest, get to know them, you know, talk, spend time with them. Um, because nowadays, a lot of kids, you know, they just want to stay on their cell phones the whole time. So we try to make a point to, you know, have a lot of face to face conversations, get to know them, um, because, you know, they, they want to know where they fit. But on top of that, they want to know, how am I going to gel with my teammates? And so that's, that's a big selling point. It's it really is. Without without telling away too too many trade secrets though what's your process like when it when it comes to uh and as simplified as you can make it when it comes to recruiting in terms of you know what's your your best method do you think of being able to identify and judge a player but then also once you make contact being able to judge and identify a player i like i like players with high iq so um i i watch a lot um within the game, just how they process the game. And you can actually see a lot of that on the defensive side, just on like if they're in helpline, they know that this person is a non-shooter. I could cheat a little bit on this to try to help my teammate here. I think you can see a lot of that on the defensive end, quite naturally when the ball's in their hand. I mean, everybody, most of the kids we're recruiting, you know they have a gift when it comes to that. So you're able to, to see that pretty easily. The other thing I like is a high motor. And uh, you can – Tell a lot of times when I go recruiting um, in high school games, I like to get there early just to see how do they warm up. You know, like are they ready to go? Are they coming out here, their shoes untied, and they're just kind of chilling? You know, looking looking cool, or you know they laced up, they're ready to go. They're getting their teammates going. They're getting a sweat before the game even starts. That's that's the thing for me. I I I mean that's to me that's important because that translates into the game. Your preparation translates into the game. And so high motor is definitely something that I look for as, as well as IQ. Not to put you on the spot too much. I'm not going to ask who your favorite player is, but when it comes to warming up or preparation, if you're the course of your career and going back to Tennessee, who is the player that puts the most emphasis on the details, whether it's practice, working out, warm ups, film, all that? For my whole coaching career or just at Tennessee? Uh, all, whole coaching career. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And somebody's going to be mad when you don't, there's, there's bound to be somebody who's annoyed with, with the answer. <laughs> I would say there's probably a top, I'll give you a top five. How about that? Okay. That works. Um, Sydney Spencer at Tennessee was always prepared and locked in, ready to go. She was always ready to go. You can always see it in her eyes. Um, at UTC, I would probably go with Shannara Hollenquist. You okay. might have to look at the archives to look her up. She was so <laughs> good player of the year. Okay. Uh, the kid was always dialed in, whether it was warm-ups or practices. At LSU, I would probably throw in Regine Moncrief. Big-time athlete, always played hard. 
always was ready to go dial in, ask a lot of questions. I think that's important too, asking a lot of questions when it comes to scouts. Um, and then quite naturally, you know, Dominique is always ready to go. Carissa's the exact same way. They were always dialed in, ready to go, um, ask a lot of questions. Re, Re as well. I mean, Re, a lot of people don't know this, has a very high basketball IQ. Re really knows the game. Um, she asks a lot of questions when it comes to scout because if she can know it in her mind before the game's played, she can know how to play angles. And I thought she did that really well. Well, in that five know, or six, how many did I give you? I don't know. That might be like 10. Okay. Um, I, you know, obviously, uh, Neek and Ree, uh, graduating, they left uh, an enormous impact and, and they're going to leave enormous holes in, in the program. But mm -hmm. the fortunate part is the fact that we have a massive, massive, uh, roster coming back, a lot of depth, a lot of mm -hmm. upperclassmen experience, um, obviously with the addition of Brooke Moore as well. And then you also have Madison and, and Rashea coming in as freshmen, um, just, Thoughts off the top of your head, you know, when you look, when you're looking forward to 2021, what do you see in this roster? I see a lot of diversity. I see a lot of depth and I see a lot of competition. Um, I'm excited about practice because with competition comes, comes an edge and it comes a, a standard of uh, consistency. So I'm excited. I'm really excited to see practice because we have so much depth. We have so much talent on this roster. Um, with the addition of, of Madison, I mean, she's a, a 6 one guard that could play one through four. I mean, she's super versatile, big time fundamentals, great passer, um, lights out shooter, super excited about her. Uh, Rashea, I mean, big time post player, um, has good moves inside, runs the floor pretty well. Um, but she, the thing I like about Rashea is she's mean. She competes. Mm -hmm. She's not going to let anybody get the best of her. And I love that. I love that. Because you need that. You need that. You need that edge sometimes. So I'm super excited about her. I think her best basketball is, is ahead of her. And then with Brooke Moore, you get, you get a fiery competitor um, that can score the ball, that can facilitate, um, that is just big-time competitor. You know, don't want anybody to get the best of her. She's going to come in. She's going to compete day in and day out. She's going to work. Um, and those three kids – being thrown in the mix with the other 14 kids that we have is just going to just make even more competition in practice. And I think that's where we're going to see the significant growth of our team because uh, it's going to be a day in and day out approach. You can't take days off when people are competing for spots. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it, man. I really am. Well, and I know, I know everyone, uh, whenever, you know, we can get back to normal, it's, we're looking forward to, to getting back and, and getting, getting practice together, getting time together. I, I talked to coach about how it has to be a little bit different that, um, you know, normally for freshmen and transfers coming in, they come in back end of May, early June for the first part of summer, and they're mm -hmm. able to work out, do some individuals or just team, you know, voluntary team workout type stuff and, and get that chemistry. It's going to be a little bit steeper for, for those three coming in. But again, not to not to gloat on the group that we have here already the team here the players are great teachers as well you know and, and something tells me they're not those three won't have an issue getting acclimated to our program no I, I don't i don't think they will at all i mean i think that i mean quite naturally our staff is going to be to help them along the way but just like you said our players are are going to help them any and every way that they can um that's just the culture that we have just being able to to help you know those first days being a freshman is different, you know, because everything is new to you. And uh, we have a good group here that's going to be able to help them on and off the court. And I think that we're going to be able to, to get a lot from them. And I think everybody's just going to blend and gel together. And I think it's going to be an exciting time. I really do. Well, um, Michael, that's, that's all I've got for you, my man. I appreciate you taking some time to, to talk to me and, uh, you know, kind of let us know how you're doing and, and just being able to catch up with you is always great. Absolutely, man. Good seeing you as well. Thanks. I appreciate it. Talk to you later, buddy. All right. Take care.